Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion number 13621 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for today. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speaker button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13621. Formally moved. Thank you. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13621, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13605, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the Stage 3 consideration of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13605. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13605, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. Next item of business is portfolio questions, education and lifelong learning. Question one, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has undertaken on its proposals to change registering teaching staff. Cabinet Secretary Angela Conson. Presiding officer, teacher data provided by individual schools was analysed to show how many teachers would be affected by changes to registration. As of September 2014, 100 independent schools employed 4,034 individuals as teachers. Uh, of this total, approximately 645 staff uh, were not registered with the General Teaching Council for Scotland. Alex Jones. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that a number of submissions to the Education and Culture Committee on the Education Scotland Bill have expressed serious concerns about the Scottish Government's proposals. In particular, the International School of Aberdeen explains that delivering its unique curriculum to a diverse group of students would not be possible if they could not hire teachers who were registered uh, with the, uh, well, who were not registered with the CTS. GTCS. How does the Cabinet Secretary plan to address these concerns? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank Mr Johnston for his uh, question. Of course, uh, there were uh, many stakeholders and indeed the, the Scottish Council of Independent Schools uh, who are keen to work with the Government uh, as we roll out these proposals uh, on ensuring that all teachers, irrespective of uh, where in the education system they work, uh, are indeed registered. And we have been working uh, with the independent sector on this matter for uh, some uh, 15 years now. With regards to the International School of uh, Aberdeen, uh, we do understand that for some independent schools, particularly the smaller ones, uh, like uh, the International School of Aberdeen, that uh, things could be um, a bit more challenging. Uh, just now, the, the school employs 68 staff. Only 11 uh, are GTCS registered. But from initial information received, more than 50% of the staff uh, who are listed as not being registered actually hold a teaching qualification, which potentially could be uh, allowed uh, to make them register. So, in the work that we will uh, take forward with the GTCS, who are already uh, leading a working group, uh, working very closely um, with the independent sector, uh, we will be uh, looking to uh, ensure that we are supportive, particularly of the smaller schools, showing some flexibility, but of course, uh, with no dilution of standards. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is in the public interest to register teachers in all school sectors so that no matter where your child is ed educated, parents will know that the quality of teaching staff is regulated by the GTCS? Well, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, I believe it is in the public interest that teachers, irrespective of whether they work uh, in state schools or state-funded schools uh, or in the independent sector, that uh, parents uh, have that reassurance that teachers uh, are registered and also that schools as employers uh, have that uh, reassurance. Uh, one of the quality marks of uh, Scottish education is that we have a graduate teaching workforce, uh, that they have a, a teaching qualification uh, and that teachers are, are registered. And, uh, the registration of uh, teachers is very important, particularly in terms of the requirements for fitness to teach and for the professional update. Uh, teaching is a learning profession and, of course, uh, we expect teachers, irrespective of where they teach, uh, to be lifelong learners as well. Question two, Paul Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met with representatives of the Scottish Funding Council and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. 
President Officer, I last met the Chair and Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council on the 4th of March and we discussed a range of matters of importance to both the HE and FE sectors in Scotland and my officials uh, regularly meet with their counterparts uh, at the Scottish Funding Council to discuss uh, a wide range of issues. Paul Martin. Uh, President Officer, I wonder when the Minister met with the Funding Council whether they discussed the plight of the 13 members of the catering staff at Glasgow Kelvin College who have been served with compulsory redundancy notices. Uh, can the Minister confirm today that it is the Scottish Government policy that there should be no compulsory redundancy notices in any sector or any employees within the college sector? Cabinet Secretary. It is indeed uh, part of the Scottish Government's public sector's pay policy uh, not to have uh, compulsory redundancies. Uh, of course, the college sector have to have regard to uh, that public sector uh, pay policy. Uh, they are not obliged to follow the detail of that public uh, sector uh, pay policy. Um, we, as a government, have consistently been clear uh, since 2011 uh, in terms of myself and my predecessor, uh, Michael Russell, about our expectations uh, with regards to the college sector and no compulsory redundancy but we've always been clear uh, that we are not in a position to uh, force the college sector to apply uh, that policy and indeed that power of direction uh, was foregone in 2005 uh, by the then Minister uh, Alan Wilson. In terms of the substantive point that Mr Martin mm. raises, which is a very important point, uh, I met with Unison this morning um, and I've also recently met uh, with, with, with EIS uh, and certainly Unison this morning took the opportunity uh, to raise the, the plight uh, of the 13 members of staff employed uh, in the canteen uh, that he uh, refers to. And while the reality of the matter is that the catering contract at Glasgow mm. Kelvin College is ultimately uh, an operational matter for the college and the firm which manages it and while the employment of catering staff is uh, the responsibility of the contractor uh, I have to say I am concerned uh, about the, the, the process about uh, how events have transpired when you look at the, the history uh, of the situation uh, and I would call on all involved to ensure uh, that as much as possible is done for those uh, who are affected and who are now facing uh, job loss. Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Given that the Scottish Government aligns its priorities with the Scottish Funding Council in terms of skills and training, why have 25,000 college places been cut in ICT at a time that there's a drastic shortage of ICT employees across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and again, that's a, a sensible point raised by uh, Mrs Scanlon. Um, it is... Um, important that our college sectors in terms of the, the courses uh, that they are funding and supporting, that that is aligned uh, with the economy uh, both uh, locally and uh, nationally. Um, in terms of the recognised qualifications um, that in terms of IT, that has largely uh, been held static. Where there has been a deprioritisation is in the, the range of uh, computing courses uh, that are about how to work a mouse, um, other digital courses um, about um, you know, how to organise your, your calendar at Christmas. And I'm not saying these things aren't important. Mrs Scanlon, Mrs is Scanlon. There is a range of ICT courses available uh, in the sector um, and it's important that the FE sector uh, focus on the ICT courses uh, that um, enable people to get into jobs and that's the HNC level um, as well as a uh, higher level as well. Of course, President Officer, we'll always uh, look at the, at the detail that Mrs Scanlon raises. We're now coming to question number three. Can I say to members and to the Minister, I would be grateful if the questions and answers were as succinct as possible to allow me to make some progress. Mark Griffin, number three. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the college student headcount in 2014-15 compares with 2008-9. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, this Government has a strong track record on colleges. Uh, we are investing more than Labour ever did. Uh, we have exceeded our commitment to maintain full-time equivalent college places uh, with over 119,000 full-time equivalent places for students in 2013-14. 
Uh, just over 14,000 more students successfully completed full-time courses, uh, leading to recognised qualifications, uh, a third higher uh, than in 2008-2009. And there are more full-time students under 25 and over 25, and the number of women studying full-time has increased 15% since 2006-07. Martin Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that information, but it's not quite the answer. Maybe she can give me that in her second answer. I asked about student headcount this year compared to 2008-09. But according to Audit Scotland, student numbers have dropped by 36% between 2008-09 and last year. That's 140,000 fewer people picking up extra skills in our colleges. 74,000 of those people who are no longer at college were adult learners people who had returned to education to pick up qualifications they didn't get at school or to retrain for a new career. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she believes colleges are still institutions for lifelong learning? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I certainly do believe colleges remain institutions for uh, lifelong learning. 27% uh, of the provision uh, is, uh, goes to people who are over the age of uh, 25. And I know that Mr Griffin and his colleagues are very uh, focused on the, the headcount measurement. But if we look at the full-time headcount measurement at Scotland's colleges, for example, by age group, uh, we will see a 17.5% increase uh, over the piece from 0607 to 1314 uh, uh, for the age group uh, 16 to 24. I think that was a very important uh, move, given that young people are always affected uh, the hardest uh, in times of uh, recession. So uh, while we have prioritised uh, young people, it's wrong to say that that has been uh, at the exclusion um, of others. And it is important that colleges, and we see that from uh, their outcome, that they are um, providing young people uh, and older learners with the opportunity to study more at full time uh, courses leading to uh, recognised courses. And for example, the full time student numbers uh, for advanced level IT courses, uh, most prized by employers, is virtually unchanged since 06 07. Question for Stuart McMillan. McMillan. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with local authorities regarding the provision of free school meals. Minister Fiona McLeod. We have worked closely with COSLA and local authorities to implement our policy of providing free school meals to all children in primary one to three. We are fully funding this policy, providing £70.5 million over two years in revenue funding and £24.8 million in capital funding. I'm delighted to say that over 129,000 primary one to three pupils are now benefiting from a healthy and nutritious free school lunch. Latest statistics show that almost 99,000 more primary school children are taking a free school meal, helping them to get the best possible start in life and succeed at school, while also delivering a saving for families of around £380 per child per year protecting household incomes and helping us to tackle the scourge of child poverty in Scotland. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply and uh, considering that the Scottish Government is fully funding uh, the extension of the free school meals policy to Premiers 1 to 3 uh, and uh, also with uh, the revenue and capital uh, funding, uh, can the Scottish Government, can the Scottish Minister uh, actually inform me if the extension of free school meals to all, all pupils in Premiers 1 to 3 has included hot meals to be one of the daily options? Minister. Um, I have to inform Mr McMillan that no, the provision of a free school meal doesn't have to be a hot school meal, but I can reassure him that the lunches can be either hot or cold, but they must comply with national requirements for school food and drink. Um, those requirements include providing a choice of two vegetables and two types of fruit every day. Now, those are set under the nutritional requirement for food and drink in schools regulations 2008. Question five, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the educational impact of schools built under PFI and PPP. Minister Alistair Allen. The Scottish Government has made clear that the PPP PFI approach used in the past has not delivered best value for the taxpayer in Scotland. As a result, since May 2007, no new PPP PFI projects have been initiated by the Scottish Government. By the time we have finished repaying these contracts, the total estimated cost will be £13.9 billion. We have tasked the Scottish Futures Trust to examine potential ways of reducing existing PPP PFI contract payments 
and they have undertaken a review of a number of operational PPP PFI contracts across Scotland to identify opportunities where, with further focused work, significant savings could be achieved. John Finney. Um, I thank the, the Minister for that very positive response um, and that stunning sum of money that is involved there. The Minister will be aware of the implications for um, music and, and um, sport, out-of-school activities and the cost that can be associated with that. I wonder would you encourage that, the uh, negative impacts of PPP, PFI to be reflected in additional sport for the fashion movement? Minister. Well, uh, the member will be aware of, uh, of my support for the, the fashion movement and the government's support for uh, arts and music kept within school. I think the, the wider point, if I, if I take it correctly, that the, the member is raising, I suppose, is about efficiency uh, and about the fact that if we ensure that in the future uh, we have more significantly uh, uh, efficient ways uh, of financing our school building projects, uh, we will ensure that there is money uh, to be put into services uh, uh, and indeed buildings in the future. Question six, Rod Campbell. Thank you, President. I was to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the post-study work visa. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Uh, this Government is committed to working with the UK Government, as recommended in the Smith report, uh, to ensure that a post-study work route is put in place in Scotland. Uh, and I very much welcome the recent backing of 100 figures from business and academia uh, for this scheme. Uh, my colleague, uh, whom is a Yousaf Minister for Europe and International Development, has twice written to the UK Minister for Immigration, uh, Mr Brokenshire and most recently on the 20th of May uh, following the UK election. And my colleague, Mr Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Education, also uh, raised this in a letter to the Home Secretary, Theresa May, on the 15th of May. And I understand that their offices are currently seeking a meeting uh, to discuss post-study work visa, amongst other matters. And in addition to this, the Scottish Government and the UK Government officials uh, met on the 23rd of January and again on the 13th of March to discuss a potential post-study work route. Roderick Campbell. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very comprehensive answer, which really deals with my supplementary. Minister. Um, well, I hope to uh, reassure um, Chamber and uh, Mr Campbell that we will indeed uh, continue to uh, keep up the uh, pressure um, and uh, colleagues will possibly be aware uh, that Hansa Yusuf has established a new cross-party uh, working group that has representatives from uh, across this chamber on and uh, we look forward uh, to uh, progressing uh, the matter further. Question 7, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what impact the use of video conferencing and other remote learning facilities can have in helping smaller secondary schools broaden the range of subjects offered at all levels. Minister Alison Allen. <clears throat> the Scottish Government acknowledges that technology can play an important role in delivering education across a wide geographic area. It can afford learners and educators the opportunity to connect from different physical locations and can help to broaden access to learning opportunities. That is one of the reasons we continue to offer GLOW. It provides all learners and teachers in Scotland free access to a range of tools and services, including web conferencing. We also support Scholar, an online learning environment that delivers regular specific live online homework and revision sessions. However, it is, of course, for schools and local authorities themselves to decide how best to deliver education services that meet local needs, including which online resources to use. Rob Gibson. Thank the Minister for that answer. And I've had examples of where uh, parents have moved their children from Far Secondary and Betty Hill to Thurso in order to access a, long, a greater number of subjects. But not only Far Secondary, but Kinloch, Bervie, Ullapool, Gairloch, uh, in my constituency, you know, all need to make CFE available in larger ranges of subjects, but have constraints on the number of teachers that they have. You know, can the minister roll out national guidelines again to ensure that students in small schools have a fairer chance to access the full range of SQA-approved certificate subjects? Minister. Well, some of the uh, technological uh, solutions that I mentioned are, of course, only part of the story uh, on the issue of staffing levels. Of course, as a member will be uh, aware, uh, this government uh, has uh, 
invested in agreement with all local authorities uh, to maintain teacher-pupil ratios. Uh, but there are, as I've indicated, many other solutions which uh, the government is happy to work with local authorities on uh, around uh, the technological uh, issues I mentioned in my first answer. Krishni, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what is it doing to ensure that secondary school pupils in the Highlands and Islands can study the subjects that they need to meet their career ambitions? Minister Alistair Allen. Well, as I just uh, indicated, the Scottish Government wants all of our learners to have access to a broad range of curriculum choices. However, responsibility for the delivery and management of the curriculum sits with local authorities. The Commission on the Delivery of Rural Education, which reported in 2013, made recommendations for local authorities about resourcing the curriculum in small rural secondary schools and highlighted the need for flexibility and innovation. We want to ensure that learners have access to the subjects they want and to have the right teachers in the right places at the right time. That is why we have provided £51 million and secured a commitment from every local authority that they will maintain teacher numbers. Rhoda Grant. The Minister will be aware that pupils in Uist have complained of not being able to study the subjects they would like to, harming their chances of accessing a further higher and edu education and the jobs they want. We have also seen fewer young people entering medicine who come from the state school sector because of the difficulty of studying the required number of sciences. What is the Minister doing to ensure that where you live and where you learn is not a barrier to, the, to your career choices in Scotland? Minister. Well, on the first point uh, regarding uh, Uist and, and Skoll Leonaklich, it won't come as a surprise to the member to know that being uh, the local member myself, I have actually met with the Director of Education uh, about uh, some of the issues that were, were raised publicly there uh, and pursue uh, and continue to keep in touch with the local authority uh, about those concerns. Uh, uh, regarding the, the wider issue that she raises about uh, science qualifications and about uh, the relevance of that for people going into medicine, I, I would, without taking away in any way from the, the importance uh, uh, of uh, qualifications uh, for, for those particularly onerous uh, entry requirements for medicine, without taking away from that, I do think we all have a responsibility to look at the changes that have been in the new qualification system and understand that in any given year, particularly in fourth year, while there may be a smaller number of subjects taken, that does not uh, mean that there will be people coming out of school at the end of their six years with fewer qualifications. And indeed, the universities uh, have been very quick to point that out. Colin Beattie. Does the Minister agree that one of the core principles of Curriculum for Excellence is that decisions are made locally to take account of local circumstances? Cabinet, a Minister. Uh, well, yes, indeed. It is, of course, the responsibility of individual local authorities and schools to decide which subjects are taught, taking account of their local circumstances and needs. Question 9, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what proportion of young people who left school in 2013-14 went on to a positive destination and what those destinations were. Cabinet Secretary. A record 91.7% of young people leaving school in 2013-14 in Scotland uh, were in a positive follow-up destination in March 2015. Follow-up positive destinations include school leavers who are in employment, uh, undertaking a modern apprenticeship, or who are participating in higher education, further education, training, voluntary work, uh, or an activity agreement uh, approximately nine months after leaving school. And I am particularly pleased that the gap between school leavers who have been looked after and their non-looked after peers is narrowing and that 73% are in positive destinations nine months after leaving school. However, uh, we always have much more work to do and must focus our efforts uh, relentlessly on closing the gap. Richard Lyle. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. And could I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she would outline what progress the Scottish Government is making in widening access for those in deprived areas to help and support them going and going to university. Cabinet Secretary. 
The um, school leaver destination figures show that 63% of school leavers are going into uh, either further or higher education. Uh, that's a record high. Uh, we have, of course, uh, made steady progress on widening access. Uh, university acceptances for those from the most uh, deprived areas uh, are increasing, and figures released by UCAS just uh, last week show a 50% increase since 2006 uh, in the application rate for 18-year-olds living in our most uh, deprived areas. Uh, these are encouraging signs, but we recognise the need to go much further, uh, and that's why we've created the Commission on Widening Access to advise ministers on achieving uh, our ambitions that a child born today, irrespective of their background, should have an equal chance uh, of access in higher education. And the Commission this week uh, has issued a call for evidence, and I encourage everyone with an interest uh, in it to respond. Question 10, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its most recent estimate is of the PFI service charges payable by the City of Edinburgh Council for school infrastructure projects. Uh, Minister Alistair Allen. The total uh, estimated unitary charge payable by the City of Edinburgh Council for its two PFI contracts is £1.27 billion. Pounds. Jimidi. Is the Minister aware that the amount which the City of Edinburgh Council has to pay in unitary charge payments for schools built using the private finance initiative is now running at an eye-watering £39.6 million for the financial year 2015-16? Does he not agree that PFI is robbing councils of much-needed resources that would improve the learning experience for many of our young people and that the people who are paying the price are the pupils, such as those at Liberton Primary School in my constituency, who are being denied the investment which is needed to fund a new five-classroom extension, which, according to the Parents' Association, would ease the pressures at the school. Minister. Well, the, the member is, of course, right to point to the fact that uh, PP, uh, P and PFI are uh, models of uh, funding which, uh, for very good reason, uh, have been consigned to history by this government. The, the member refers uh, to the, the, two PPI, the two PPP and PFI rather, projects which have been uh, embarked upon uh, in the past by Edinburgh, uh, the first of which had a capital value of £129 million, uh, and unitary payments of £527 million, uh, and the second of which had a capital value of £208 million, uh, and unitary payments uh, totalling £743 million. Now, while I accept and we all must accept that these, these payments will include things like ongoing maintenance and management of buildings, uh, I think the case is uh, very clearly made uh, as to why the government decided that these were policies uh, that were best changed and better uh, ways of funding our school buildings in the future had to be found. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Does the Scottish Government consider that local authorities are best able to tackle the budget difficulties when they are making spending decisions autonomously? Minister? Well, of course, it is up to local authorities uh, how they spend their money, but I think local authorities throughout the country uh, would increasingly come to the view that we would, uh, which is that uh, government has to work with local authorities to find systems of funding uh, large capital projects which do not burden uh, the taxpayer locally or nationally with undue payments into the distant future. Question 11, Colin Keir. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that school leavers are given the best opportunity to go on to a positive destination. Minister. Captain Secretary. Officer, the proportion of young people who left school and who have sustained a positive destination, as I said earlier, has reached a record 91.7%. Uh, uh, Curriculum for Excellence offers young people learning which promotes both academic and vocational qualifications, which are informed by the needs of our employers. Developing the young workforce mm. sets out our aim to further the links between education and industry, and our Opportunities for All commitment ensures an offer of further learning or training that, that that's in place for all young people until their 20th birthday. Uh, young people are better supported than ever to make the most of the opportunities available to them, and this includes better career information, advice and guidance, so that they can make informed learning and career choices based on labour market demand. Colin Keir. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for an answer. Uh, would she agree with me that the actions taken at Craig Royston Community High School in my constituency, which has seen a magnificent improvement in HMIE reports through enlightened changes to its curriculum, as well as partnership with local businesses, should be seen as an excellent model in preparing students for a life beyond school, as well as, me, as, well as being a source of pride 
for the local community. Uh, yes, I would, President Officer. I have uh, visited uh, Craig Royston Community High School on two occasions now, uh, the first of which was to uh, launch um, the um, Commission for Developing uh, Scotland's Young Workforce, uh, the report. Uh, I very much congratulate the head teacher, staff and pupils uh, of Craig Royston on the improvements uh, that they have made. Uh, and, of course, Education Scotland has identified some key strengths uh, in the school in terms of their uh, coordinated and high-quality support uh, for both young people and their families and that shared vision, vision that is securing positive destinations uh, for uh, young people, uh, all of which is uh, key aspects of uh, raising uh, attainment. And I know that the, the head teacher uh, shared his curriculum model with other secondary head teachers uh, at a national conference on curriculum for excellence earlier this year. Question 12, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what importance it places on the role of college principals. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, colleges are vital to our continued success in education, helping to develop a skilled, productive workforce uh, that drives our economy. Uh, strong and ambitious leaders are essential in realising uh, this ambition. Uh, we are fortunate to have a wealth of talent and commitment in our college principals and their staff. Uh, and I was pleased last week to launch the new guide for college board members to support them in meeting their responsibilities. And I also took the opportunity to thank them uh, for their commitment, uh, which has contributed to huge progress in college reform. MD. Thank you. Christina Potter, the principal of Dundee and Angus College, retires from FE tomorrow. She is calling time on her 17 years plus career as a principal, which began at Elmwood in 1997, took in leadership at Dundee College before overseeing the successful merger of Dundee and Angus Colleges. Uh, she is also a straight to the point and highly respected member of the Board of Scotland's Colleges. Would the Cabinet Secretary join me in acknowledging Christina Potter's fantastic contribution to the sector and wishing her a very long and enjoyable retirement? Uh, of course, President Officer, uh, I welcome the opportunity to add my best wishes and thanks to Christina Potter as she retires uh, from her role as the Principal of Dundee and uh, Angus College. Uh, her leadership and commitment has allowed for the successful creation uh, of the new regional college and she departs having established the college's uh, reputation as a highly respected and forward-looking institution. Uh, and I hope that she will continue to uh, find a way to share uh, her concerns considerable experience and expertise uh, that she has developed uh, over her many years in education. Bruce Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments to Paul Martin in relation to the uh, Canteen 13 at Kelvin College? Um, given that many former principals have themselves enjoyed uh, enhanced redundancy arrangements, does she agree that current principals, whose role does involve uh, decisions about redundancy for others, should perhaps have more regard for fa uh, fairness uh, to those who are lower paid? And will she make that point to college principals, including uh, the principal of Glasgow Kelvin College, uh, who on the 9th of June wrote to Glasgow members and indicating that he could do no more for the Canteen 13. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's imperative that we all always look to doing more. I mean, it is fair to say that there are uh, limitations. There are limitations uh, on the, the, the role of ministers uh, in resolving this matter to, uh, and in a way that would be to the satisfaction, certainly, of, of people um, across uh, this chamber. Um, the important aspects of um, college reform is that it has improved um, account accountability. Um, and I know that Mr Smith uh, touched upon the issues uh, of voluntary uh, severance. Uh, and of course, there is now far more uh, rigorous procedures in place in terms of uh, signing of voluntary uh, uh, severance uh, agreements. Uh, but in terms of the issue with regards to the uh, canteen staff, it is important uh, that everybody, where possible, uh, pulls together uh, to ensure um, that canteen staff can look forward uh, to uh, a future. And I know that uh, there may be some opportunities for continuous employment uh, in the college sector uh, that some members of the canteen staff uh, would be willing to pursue. Question 13, I'm McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with the management of Glasgow Clyde College and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. 
presiding officer, there have been no recent meetings with the management of Glasgow Clyde College. Uh, one of my officials attended a meeting of the board uh, of Clyde College on the 19th of May 2015 uh, at the invitation of the board's chair uh, to outline the expectations of Scottish ministers in relation to compliance with uh, the Code of Good Governance for Scotland's colleges. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Um, whilst the, the Cabinet Secretary haven't, hasn't met recently um, and her officers have, can you possibly, the outline that was mentioned there, was there a discussion that the government has, have they had with the college management to reassure students and secure nominations for the executive positions? And what implications are for the funding of the college if they do not have a students association? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, uh, Ms McTaggart raises a very important issue about student uh, representation. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, I launched with the sector uh, guidance and uh, a body of work uh, about uh, how the sector should pull together to support uh, the sustainability of student associations. And I'm very disappointed to hear um, that there were no students putting themselves forward for a variety of reasons uh, at the, the Glasgow Clyde College. Uh, and that uh, greatly concerns me. Uh, there are a number of issues um, in and around uh, that matter that I'm paying very uh, close attention to um, and I am in regular dialogue with my officials uh, and indeed uh, the Scottish Funding Council because um, having the involvement of students on boards is most certainly not an optional extra. It's part and parcel of what we do. Question 14, Colin Beattie. Is the Scottish Government what actions it is taking to support and develop the use of Doric and Lalland Scots? Minister Alistair Allen. The Scottish Government is a strong supporter of Scots language in all its forms, including Doric and Lalands. In particular, we have appointed a team of Scots language coordinators to support Scots in schools throughout Scotland. Later this year, we will publish our policy on the Scots language. We have encouraged and continue to encourage, by means of Education Scotland, the study of Scottish texts in schools. We continue to fund key organisations, including Traditional Arts and Culture Scotland, the Scottish Book Trust, Scottish Poetry Library, the National Library of Scotland, Scottish Language Dictionaries and the Scots Language Centre. The Scottish Government also values Scots as a, val a language of everyday communication and, like Creative Scotland, will accept any form of correspondence in Scots. Colin Beath. I thank the Minister for his response. Given the increasingly successful support and recognition given to Gaelic as a native language, are there any plans to similarly support the use of Scots as a mainstream language in education and culture? Minister? Well, as I've indicated, uh, the Government and certainly me uh, personally uh, have a very strong commitment in this area and uh, the fact that the SQA has, for instance, developed a Scots language award uh, is uh, is testimony to their own uh, uh, dedication in that area, as well as providing an opportunity to learn Scots. The award also touches on Scots' uh, uh, history and dialects. Uh, Education Scotland's Scots coordinators, whom I mentioned, have also developed a series of training sessions for teachers wishing to learn how to teach about the Scots language in schools. There's the potential of study of Scots in many other areas, such as the inclusion within the Scottish Studies Award and, indeed, Scottish texts within the National Five and Higher English exams. Uh, together with the, the work we're doing for Scots in the community, I believe this does represent a strong commitment from the Scottish Government. Question 15, Karen Hilton. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with Fife College regarding the future of lifelong learning. Cabinet Secretary, Andrew Constant. Officer. The Scottish Government engages regularly with colleges in Scotland and through the Scottish Funding Council uh, we support the delivery uh, of high quality lifelong learning. Cara Hilton. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that last week it was revealed that 4,000 student places are being axed at Fife College and this represents one third of all part time places currently available in Fife. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give my constituents in Dunfermline who are looking to get back into part-time study for bringing up children who are looking, or are looking to retrain or reskill in the evening that there will be lifelong learning opportunities available in future? And what actions will the Scottish Government take to give adult education the investment and the priority it deserves? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, the figures that uh, Ms Hilton refers to 
um, are based on the College's own planning assumptions. Uh, the latest official figures uh, are available are uh, for 2013-14. And the figures that the College uh, has supplied do illustrate uh, an expected increase uh, in full-time equivalent uh, numbers going forward for 2015-16. Um, in terms of uh, part-time uh, provision, part-time provision still does exist um, across uh, the sector uh, and we have asked colleges to deliver, for example, more for women, uh, including uh, an investment of £6.5 million in 2014-15 for part-time places, uh, which are often uh, favoured by women and uh, older uh, learners. And women, of course, have been supported with uh, record levels of student support and the Funding Council is investing over £104 million this academic year in bursaries, childcare and discretionary funds. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. The next item of business is a statement by...